What makes a good children's story? It's a good question, one we've been asking for a while, but maybe not as long as you think. As with most literature, children's stories almost certainly started in the oral tradition with things like Aesop's fables and other folk tales across various cultures, but those weren't necessarily told specifically for children. It was only in 1744 when the first story written and sold explicitly for children's entertainment was released, John Newberry's A Little Pretty Pocketbook. So stories specifically for children's entertainment haven't really been around for that long in the grand scheme of things, at least not in the West. But we've certainly been making a lot of headway since. Fast forwarding to the 20th century and we have fantasy stories like The Lord of the Rings and The Chronicles of Narnia along with picture books like Curious George and The Little Engine That Could. And with the advent of American cinema and a little guy you might have heard of named Walt Disney, children's stories now had picture and sound. Steamboat Willie's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Pinocchio along with other lesser known works such as Fleischer Studios Gulliver's Travels were among the first examples of children's stories in American film. And as the century progressed, this new genre only became more pervasive, with filmmakers like George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Richard Donner eventually making such children's classics as Star Wars, E.T., and Superman. And by the Disney Renaissance in the 90s, with films from The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast to Mulan and Tarzan, American children's films had really proven themselves as their own beast entirely. And I'm leaving a lot out here, the revolutionary work of Hayao Miyazaki and his influence on Western animation, the birth of Pixar in the mid-90s, the unparalleled cultural impact of Shrek. But I'm not here to tell you all about the history of children's cinema. That could be an hour-long video in its own right. The point I'm trying to make is that children's stories and media, specifically children's movies, are a massive part of our cultural consciousness and have been for a long time. Hell, some of the most profitable franchises of recent memory at least started life as children's stories, from Harry Potter to Marvel. Children's stories are at the forefront of pop culture at almost all times, so why the hell don't we talk about Kung Fu Panda all the time? Everybody is that's right, the Kung Fu panda sauce is back on. I'm bringing it back, baby. Released in 2008, Kung Fu Panda is perhaps the biggest bait-and-switch in cinematic history. You see a title like that, see Jack Black's name on the poster, hear CeeLo Green singing Kung Fu fighting, and naturally, you just kind of assume this is going to be a fat joke laden waste of an hour and a half that you're going to have to take your kids to because they won't shut up about it because there's a trailer for it every other commercial break on Cartoon Network. But then, by complete surprise, it ends up being good. Really good. It ends up having some of the most inventive action sequences and fight scenes in Western animation. It ends up being full of heart and genuine emotion. It ends up being more than just a children's story. And now, in 2021, the Kung Fu Panda series is a trilogy of films with a near cult following that has taken so much time to dive into the deeper aspects of the films, like the way they explore various Eastern philosophies. But I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I want to take a look specifically at what makes this trilogy a good children's story in itself. I feel like we sometimes get so caught up in the adult themes and the philosophy that we forget these stories are made with kids in mind. And I want to try to understand that by looking at the lessons these stories try to teach, the morals at the center. Kung Fu Panda is, in essence, a story all about teachers and students. It's about learning, not just Kung Fu, but also about figuring out who you are and how to deal with your problems. Ultimately, the Kung Fu Panda trilogy is all about teaching kids things we often fail to teach them. And so today, we're going to go over what those lessons are, one for each film in the series, and it's only natural to start at the beginning. I remember seeing this movie all over the place as a kid, in the aforementioned commercial breaks on Cartoon Network, McDonald's commercials, I played the demo for the game over and over and over and over again. And I'm pretty sure Tigress's eyes paired with Angelina Jolie's voice awoke something in me as a kid, but I don't actually remember watching the movie itself that much. I'm pretty sure I watched it at some point, but I don't have any specific memories of doing so. I mean, why watch Kung Fu Panda when I could play Far Far Away Idol on my DVD copy of Shrek 2? Did that reference feel forced? Yeah, but when the hell else am I going to get to mention this? For about half the contestants you could pick as a winner, Simon would literally just say, nah, and pick himself. What the fuck was this? My point is that it wasn't really until I became an adult that I watched Kung Fu Panda properly, and it wasn't really until I watched it very recently that I realized, I love this movie. A lot. The colors, the music, the set pieces, the animation, the super tight plotting and pacing, the bridge scene, the bridge scene. But unfortunately, as amazing as all that is, it's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about a panda named Poe. And Poe is a big fat noodle boy who has one deeply seated passion. I love Kung Fu! Oh. 
It's a trope we've seen many times before and since this movie. The character usually a certain type of animal that wants to do something they don't seem like they would usually be able to do. But through the simple power of believing in themselves, they show the world that nothing is impossible, yada yada yada. But Kung Fu Panda does it well, and like with most well done versions of this trope, that's because of the character of Poe himself. And I think one of the greatest parts of that is the man who plays him. Listen, I get that celebrity voice acting has rightfully come under fire as of late, but for me, Kung Fu Panda's cast still does a phenomenal job across the board, and the absolute best of them is National Treasure and America's sweetheart, Jack Black, as Poe. What his performance adds is not only his trademark likability and unapologetic goof, but also a strange sense of honesty propelled by the writing. The trope works for me here because instead of feeling tacked on to a pre-existing character, this desire to be something no one thinks he can be is the character. From the start of the movie in this gorgeous 2D animated intro, we see that Poe's fantasies are as centered on how people perceive him as they are on him fulfilling his passions. And that's not to say that his passions are inauthentic, in fact Poe's passions are nothing if not sincere. Look at his bedroom, look at how much he geeks over the Hall of Heroes, look at how much he tries just to see his heroes in action. But that passion is linked to others' perceptions of who he is and what he's able to do. Every time you threw a brick at my head, or said I smelled, it hurt! but it could never hurt more than it did every day of my life just being me. There's almost a sense of self-hatred here. And of course the movie never goes too far into that, but it kind of doesn't need to. The situation speaks for itself. Poe literally landed in the middle of everything, found himself with a destiny he never actually believed was supposed to be his, and then has to sit there and hear his new master point out every one of his insecurities about his physical appearance and listen to one of his own heroes tell him. You're a disgrace to Kung Fu, and if you have any respect for who we are and what we do, you will be gone by morning. Damn. Poe is placed into a situation where his passion and self-image are clashing together. His desire to become everything he's ever wanted, and the entire reason he never chased that dream to begin with. Unlike many of the characters who fall into this trope, Poe isn't actively trying to make his fantasies a reality. He isn't doing everything in his power to prove everyone wrong about him. He isn't even training or trying to learn Kung Fu in any real way before Shifu. He's more than willing to let other people's expectations of what he's supposed to be define who he can be. Unlike Remy or Judy Hopps or Wreck-It Ralph, Poe is not initially active in trying to change his unfulfilling life. Because as far as Poe is concerned, he's not enough for that. He can't handle that. He doesn't believe in himself precisely because no one else does. Poe is whoever other people think he is or want him to be. Because what he wants to be isn't something anyone thinks he can be. It's this circular logic, this loop he can't seem to break, and even when he's given the opportunity to break it, his focus becomes on being someone he isn't. Rejecting everything that makes him who he is, showing shame for everything he is. Whether it's a fat panda body or just his inexperience with kung fu. But this idea of defining yourself by others' perceptions isn't exclusive to just Poe. Tai Lung is the film's villain, and at first glance, he's everything you expect a kid's film villain to be. He wants power, he has a dark heart, and he wants the film's MacGuffin, the Dragon Scroll, over all else. You know, the works. And the film mostly leaves it at that for the first two acts, solidifying his threat through the absolutely gorgeous prison escape sequence, but still not really acting to develop the character any further than power, dark heart, MacGuffin. The closest the film gets is through this flashback sequence. He was left at Shifu's doorstep, took an interest in Kung Fu, but then fell to the allure of the power of the Dragon Scroll. Shifu couldn't stop him because he didn't want to hurt the son he raised, so Ugwe stopped him instead. But even that is more to develop Shifu's character and how Tai Lung betrayed him than it is about Tai Lung himself. But then, after Tai Lung escapes, defeats all the Furious Five, and Shifu realizes that the Dragon Scroll is nothing more than a reflective piece of paper, the two are forced to face each other for the first time in 20 years, and we suddenly get a much different story than we got before. I am a king! I did to make you proud! Tell me how proud you are, Chifu! Tell me! Tell me! Shifu raised Tai Lung as his own child. He told him that he could be the Dragon Warrior, told him he deserved the Dragon Scroll, but Tai Lung never asked for those expectations. He never wanted that purpose. Shifu thrust that upon him. And then when he was unable to fulfill those expectations, when he couldn't be what Shifu told him he was meant to be, Shifu turned his back on him. The darkness in Tai Lung's heart wasn't just a part of him that couldn't be changed. It was placed there by the master, the father, who failed him. I have always been proud of you. 
from the first moment I've been proud of you. And it was my pride that blinded me. I loved you too much to see what you were becoming. What I was turning you into. It's one thing to tell kids to believe in themselves, but it's a whole other thing to tell them that it's not their fault they were expected to be something they could never be. And then to tell them that there is no secret ingredient? It's just you? The Dragon Scroll itself is a basic symbol, but it has a lot of power. Because for Tai Lung, strength was something you trained for, something you earn, something you gain, something that someone else has to give you. The Dragon Scroll is nothing more than a reminder that strength, in whatever form it takes, is innate. It's a part of you. And Poe and Shifu only succeed when they realize that. When Poe stops trying to be what other people want him to be and just embraces who he is. Even the final fight is less of the dramatic, climactic showdown we generally expect. Instead, it's more of a celebration of all that makes Poe, Poe. And just imagine that from a kid's perspective, especially a kid with maybe a developmental disorder or a physical disability of some kind, or whatever else they'll invariably be told to be ashamed of. Watching Poe succeed not because he ran away from what made him who he was, but because he embraced it. And watching Tai Lung fail because he could only ever allow himself to be what others told him he was supposed to be. Imagine seeing that when you've been told the exact opposite your entire life. The lesson of Kung Fu Panda is, the only person who can define you, is you. Let's move on. So, Kung Fu Panda is a massive success for DreamWorks Animation. It was the highest grossing non-Shrek film for the studio at the time, and was nominated for Best Animated Feature at the 81st Academy Awards. So, naturally, they're like, hey, Jennifer Yu Nelson, who directed those amazing 2D animated dream sequences in the first movie, you want to direct the sequel? Get ready, because I'm about to throw a lot of platitudes your way, and they're all accurate. Kung Fu Panda 2 was bigger, darker, and truly the Empire Strikes Back of the Kung Fu Panda trilogy, and is, for me, by far the best of the series. Bigger, more complex set pieces, a more intellectual villain, and deeper character drama, all alongside a lesson that very few kids ever get to learn. I want to approach this one a bit differently and start with our villain, Shen, played brilliantly by Gary Oldman. Shen is similar to Tai Lung in a couple ways. His main goal is gaining power, and he revels in his evilness, but there are many more differences. For one thing, instead of a snow leopard, he's a peacock. And while he can certainly hold his own in a fight, he's much more focused on the cerebral and the theatrical, his words often being far more useful than his fists. And <laughs> this comparison is going to sound kind of dumb, but he sort of reminds me of Shakespeare's Richard III. He's ultra-villainous, literally written to be a shitbag, is most capable when utilizing language to manipulate others, and most of all, is only a villain because his own family treats him like one. My parents hated me. Do you understand? His entire character is based on his refusal to come off as weak, or vulnerable to project an image of himself as being cold, uncaring, and secure in his motives and identity. The idea that his parents hated him and sent him away because they feared him is not something he's willing to feel, only acknowledge. So instead, he takes those painful feelings of the past and extrapolates them into some greater destiny of ruling over China. Then he doesn't have to confront those feelings on their own. His entire plot is a means of coping with his own sense of inadequacy and the desire to control his own destiny. And it was that desire to control his own destiny that led him to do what started everything. Poe's story in this film is about finding inner peace, symbolized visually as being able to guide the path of a single drop of water. And this is something he finds difficult as from the beginning of the film, Poe's understanding of himself is becoming increasingly chaotic as he's being forced to question his own origins and his very identity. The central question for Poe at the heart of the film is, who am I? With these flashes of a past long forgotten, the revelation that somehow Ping is not his biological dad, and the introduction of this new enemy who was there when he lost his parents, all Poe wants to do is exactly what Shen is doing project strength, and avoid the emotions swirling around in his head. 
This is encapsulated in one of my favorite scenes in the movie, this quiet little exchange between Poe and Tigress. Tigress tells him that she can't feel pain after having punched ironwood trees for 20 years, and when Tigress tries to get Poe to open up about what he's feeling, he shows almost a kind of envy towards that ability. And this bothers you? Are you kidding me? We're warriors, right? Nerves of steel, souls of platinum, like you. This friendship between Poe and Tigris is probably one of my favorite things in the film, actually. In the first movie, Tigris was Poe's greatest critic and detractor, the one who took the most offense to seeing Poe be chosen as the dragon warrior, but this film sees Tigris almost as a best friend for Poe. While he works well with all the Furious Five, it's with Tigris that he seems to have the greatest connection. And it's that friendship that takes the hardest member of the group and allows her to be the first to show vulnerability to openly feel and act on the worry she has for a friend without any shame whatsoever. When Tigress hugs Poe, she shows no embarrassment, expresses no fear of how the others will now perceive her. She is unabashedly honest in the simple fact that she cares about her friend and doesn't want to see him get hurt. Among this story of two people desperately trying to avoid their emotions, Tigress is here embracing and acting on hers. The hardcore do understand but I can't watch my friend be killed. But that example isn't quite enough to help Poe find inner peace. The way inner peace is described by Shifu is recognizing when a problem does not exist with another, but within oneself. Finding inner peace is a matter of confronting those things about yourself that you may not want to confront. And Poe has thoroughly externalized his problems in Shen, in his mind necessitating a face-off. So, against Tigress's wishes, Poe goes after Shen in the middle of his factory. They have a small fight only for Poe to corner Shen and demand the truth. Well, here's your answer. Your parents didn't love you. Gary Oldman's line read here is masterful as joy slips into his cadence. Shen getting to tell somebody else what he's always believed about himself. Your parents didn't love you. And that's what has bothered Poe from the beginning. Why else would he be abandoned in a radish basket? It's shown in rather comedic ways, sure, but the underlying anxiety is real and palpable and persistent. It's the reason Poe refuses to let it go at the same time as it's the reason he refuses to confront it head on. It makes sense that Poe thinks this way, doesn't it? After everything in the first movie, the self-image he created where who he was wasn't ever good enough. And as Kung Fu, the one thing that allowed him to embrace his identity is endangered, here is the idea that shatters his entire perception of who he is. Your parents didn't love you. Poe floats down a river, unconscious and nearly dead when his body passes by the soothsayer that Shen set free. She nurses him back to health, and he awakes tired and bruised in a place he doesn't recognize. But soon, he starts to remember. He remembers an idyllic panda village, sunlit and green. He remembers a child laughing and playing and happy. But then it's red and ablaze. It's terrifying and scary. This child is crying now, clutching to his little doll. He doesn't know what's going on. His mother grabs him and runs away with him. He loses his doll to the fire. His mother leaves him somewhere. <laughs> Stop fighting. Let it flow. One of the hardest, most unfair things we have to do is feel painful feelings. Whether it's grief or heartbreak or trauma, we have no choice but to experience pain. But it's so much easier to bottle all that up, keep it inside of you, and never, ever, ever let it out. And the more we have to bottle up, the more we cope with anger and bitterness, the more we chase external glory or desires, and it only ever gets worse and worse as we try to fill that hole where we won't allow those painful feelings to go. We want to control the entire downpour because we're afraid of getting wet, but we still get drenched anyway, and we allow it to weigh us down until we can barely even move. That's what Poe's been doing this whole time. But the rain isn't what's stopping him. He's what's stopping him. Stop fighting. Let it flow. You can't control an entire downpour, but you can maybe guide the path of a single raindrop. Imagine being a kid watching this movie and being told that sometimes things hurt, 
Maybe not in a way you can see, but just in a way you can feel. And you might want to run away from that, keep pushing it down, or externalize it, because yeah, it's hard to feel that way. It's really hard sometimes. But that pain doesn't make you who you are. It is the rest of your story. Who you choose to be. And that's the kind of power that lets you face down an entire army all by yourself. By taking those things that hurt you and not running from them, not pushing them down, but facing them and letting them flow. And never letting those painful feelings from the past distract you from the people who care about you now. Shen lets his pain destroy him, but Po allows it to flow inside of him, be a part of him. And that's the lesson of Kung Fu Panda 2. You have to feel your feelings, even if they hurt, because only then can you be who you are. So, who are you, Panda? I am Po. I'm not as big a fan of Kung Fu Panda 3, honestly. Don't get me wrong, I like it, love parts of it. It's just as gorgeously animated and beautifully impressionistic. The writing's still tight and the performances are all great, but it feels like it's starting to have a bit of trouble figuring out how to progress this story, evidenced by the fact that they spend it trying to answer a question they literally just answered one movie ago. I like who I am. You don't even know who you are. I know who I am. Make up your mind. But there's still a great story here, there's still a lesson to be learned, and it starts again with Poe. What's interesting about Kung Fu Panda 3 is that it takes the themes of students and teachers and through Poe's arc puts it at the forefront of the entire narrative. Being able to teach what he's learned is labeled as the next step of Poe's training. It places him in a position of power and authority that he doesn't really want to be in. But Shifu tells him, If you only do what you can do, you will never be more than you are now. But Poe doesn't want that authority. He doesn't want to be put on a pedestal. He doesn't want to have that kind of pressure on him. He wants things to stay the same. And that's why when Kai shows up seeking to take everyone's chi and destroy Uguay's legacy, Poe is more willing to travel with his newly found father, Li Shan, to learn how to use chi in order to stop him. He's being put back into the role of student, learning something new to defeat some great enemy. Because it's a lot easier to just remain who you are now than to try and be more. But throughout the film is this slight disquiet. As Poe continues to learn how to be a panda, he keeps asking his father when he'll be ready to master Chi and stop Kai. As much comfort as he takes in everything remaining the same, the responsibility of his role is still very present. And if he's going to stop Kai, he has to learn Chi, because otherwise he just won't be equipped to handle this. While Kai is certainly a far less complex villain than his counterparts, he is undoubtedly the most powerful. He defeats Ukwe himself less than five minutes into the movie, and then he defeats all the Furious Five, plus Shifu, and destroys the entire Jade Palace with a statue of Ukwe. He wants all power and knowledge to be exclusive to himself, going against everything Ukwe was and believed in. And Lee was supposed to teach Poe how to handle that. Lee was supposed to teach Poe how to make things right again, how to use Chi to defeat Kai and save the valley. Lee was supposed to teach him who he really was and how to deal with all this stuff, but instead... Because I don't know it! You lie? No, I... Yes. Why? To save your life. I find out some blade-swinging maniac is coming for you. What am I supposed to do? Just, just let that happen? Yes! I'm the dragon warrior, facing maniacs. That's my job. But because of you, I left the valley unprotected. I left my friends unprotected. And now they're all... They're all... And you would have been too. I lost you once. I am not going to lose you again. I can't. You just did. The funny thing about how we talk about children's media is that we can't just like it as it is. 
We have to qualify it somehow. We have to bring up the adult jokes that kids won't get. We have to talk about all the adult themes. We say, oh, this isn't just for kids. It's got stuff about Eastern philosophy in it. It's got all this character drama and these complex ideas as though all of those are things that kids just can't understand. We treat children's media in general like it's inherently lesser, like all it needs to be is pretty colors and fat jokes, and that's all it should be expected to be. And if it's more, or more appropriately, if it finds an adult audience, we hardly ever talk about it like it's ever even been for kids. In fact, we want very badly to separate it as much as possible from that initial audience, because we feel a sense of shame enjoying something meant primarily for children. Li Shan, as a character, is someone who wants to protect his child from the world. Someone who never got the chance to really raise his own son, so he wants to hold him back, limit who he can become. He wants Poe to still be that picture of innocence he used to be, back when he still had his wife, back when everything was happy, back when everything was the way it was supposed to be. So he lied. He created a reality where he could raise his son in peace and have all that time back with him that he lost. Regardless of what that means for the world, regardless of what that means for Poe. In the end, this trilogy isn't really about teachers and students, it's about children and their parents. It's about a father telling his son he was supposed to be something he could never be. It's about a mother and father terrified of their own child, who then spent the entire rest of his life trying to destroy what they left behind and fill the hole where their love was supposed to go. It's about a father who just wanted the chance to raise and love the son he lost, but in doing so, limited what his son was allowed to be. Kung Fu Panda is the story of parents failing their children. Instead of talking to their son, Shen's parents effectively gave up on him and tried to figure out how he could be stopped. Instead of being there for Tai Lung when he needed him most, Shifu turned away from him because he couldn't be what Shifu told him he was supposed to be. And Lee couldn't teach Poe anything he actually needed to know. Because if he were to equip him to handle the harshest realities of life, he would have to admit that Poe couldn't be the innocent son he never got to have. But while both Shen and Tai Lung refuse to learn those lessons, Lee realizes that he can't make a world where his son doesn't need to learn. And he can't make a world where he doesn't need to learn himself. We dismiss children's stories because by the time we're an adult, we feel like we're supposed to have all this figured out already. There's a pressure to already know who you are and how to deal with your problems. We're supposed to already know what we believe and what we're supposed to do when things get hard, whether those are practical skills or emotional ones. We're supposed to not have any more lessons left to learn. We dismiss children's stories because to engage with them on any level beyond simple acknowledgement would be to admit that there are lessons we never learned, lessons we were never taught. I recently turned 23 years old, and it's easy for me to wonder sometimes if everyone else got some training manual at some point that they just forgot to give me. It's easy to think that I'm way behind and feel a sense of shame at the fact that there are so many things I've never done and so many things I don't know. I wonder constantly if the reason for that is just that I'm not good enough if I can't handle growing up. And part of that fear has persevered within my abiding love for children's media, for Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks, for Avatar and Harry Potter and Spider-Man, for Kung Fu Panda. I love these stories. I loved them when I was a kid and I love them now, and I wonder sometimes if I should be ashamed of that. I feel like I need to qualify my love for these stories by bringing up the stuff for adults. Because if I don't, then I reveal that I still kind of identify with this stuff for kids. But while I'm sure part of it is just a desire to go back to the way things used to be, to live that simpler life I feel like was ripped away from me, I think it's also because the lessons these stories teach aren't just for kids. I don't think they ever were. Because maybe a good children's story is just that. A good story. And just because I'm an adult now doesn't mean I can't still learn what I wasn't taught. The only person who can define me is me. I have to feel my feelings even if they hurt because only then can I be who I am. And more than anything else, there is always something more to learn. You can never know everything. You can never know all of who you are and what you believe in is probably going to change over time. 
People are complicated like that. But we can share what we've learned with each other, and we can always learn something new if we're willing to. If any of these lessons are new to you, or if you've heard them before, but you have trouble learning them and implementing them, I need you to know this. It's not because you aren't enough. It's not because you can't learn them. It's not because you missed the boat when you were a kid. It's because these lessons can be hard to learn. And there are people out there who will stand by you while you learn them. Even if the people who were supposed to didn't. At the very least, these stories will. I want to end this by looking back on one of my favorite scenes in the first movie. Shifu goes to Ugwe, telling him that Tai Lung has escaped, and Ugwe says that Po will stop him. But Shifu refuses to believe that. Master, that panda is not the dragon warrior. He wasn't even meant to be here. It was an accident. Ugwe tells him that he needs to let go of the illusion of control using the peach tree they stand under as an example. I cannot make it blossom when it suits me, nor make it bear fruit before its time. Shifu argues, says that there are things that he can control, like when the fruit will fall or where to plant the seed, but Ugwe tells him still that he can't control what the seed is. It will always be a peach tree. And I'm going to leave it at the exchange that follows. I hope you learned something. But a peach cannot defeat Tai Lung. Maybe it can, if you are willing to guide it, to nurture it to believe in it.